Okay, for this week's colloquium, our speaker this week is Professor Douglas Scott. So most of us know him. Uh, he started here at UBC in 1996. Today, Douglas's uh, colloquium will be on physics pranks and astronomical antics, and it's, it's a special for April Fool's Day. So go ahead, uh, Douglas. Thanks, Janice. So you've all come here to hear a talk about jokes and so on, and I was thinking carefully about that, and I, I sort of thought better of it, and I thought, you know, that's really not appropriate in the colloquium schedule. Uh, Oh, this isn't changing for, oh, there we go. So I think I'd rather talk about the capacitor. So the capacitor, well, it's a fascinating physics device and I should explain to you how it works. So, you know, there's lots of details on this slide. The most important thing obviously are the lines of flux. Um, and if you can compress these lines of flux, particularly from three different directions, then uh, you can make a flux capacitor and then uh, you can go back to the future. Um, and my favorite part of the movie is Great Scott, obviously, for obvious reasons. Uh, so, so I'm not going to talk about the capacitor. Um, I know there are members of our department who've heard 100 capacitance talks. Um, so I'm not going to give them a 101st capacitance talk. So I am going to talk about silly things in physics astronomy. So this is not going to be at all serious, but hopefully you're going to learn a few bits and pieces. Um, and, you know, if there's a serious message at all, it's that, that you know, humor is an important part. Of and, uh, and there's a lot of humor in physics and astronomy, despite the fact that on the whole, we regard it as a very serious thing to do. But we also have a lot of fun doing it. So is there actually any connection between physics and comedy? Well, people argue about the nature of comedy. And about the only thing they can agree on is that incongruity is an important aspect of what makes things funny. And, and also analogy, things being like other things or, or very much not like other things. And I think incongruity and analogy are, are also very important in physics. Uh, so people have you know, discussed how there's very close analogies. Um, but can we actually use physics to understand the nature of humor? So can we use physics to, to figure out what makes things funny? And I was inter interested to see that there's a recent paper um, which is about using quantum mechanics to understand humor. And actually one of ours is one of our UBC Okanagan uh, colleagues. So maybe I'll get her to come give a talk on this. Um, and what they do in this paper is they analyze this well-known joke, which is uh, time flies like an arrow, but fruit flies like a banana. And they basically analyze this with quantum mechanics using different states and uh, something becomes funny when it's, when it's measured. Um, and I, I absolutely assure you that I did not make this up and the paper is real and, and the paper is not a joke. It's about jokes, but it's a serious attempt to use physics to understand humor. Um, let me discuss a few early connections going back way in history between science and humor. So about the earliest thing that I can find is uh, Theophrastus who basically took over from Aristotle in the Athens school. Uh, he wrote extensively about the nine results survive, but he wrote about what we would now call physics among other things. Uh, and he also wrote about human characteristics and wrote some uh, basically comic pieces about different kinds of people and what makes them different. And, uh, and it's basically a, a, a piece of humor. So he was writing about humor and about physics more than 2000 years ago. Um, there's a, a, a famous person with the same surname as me, one of the earliest uh, on record that sort of did anything at all. He's called Michael Scott. He's usually spelled with a single T. He was an astrologer slash astronomer because in those days they were the same thing. <clears throat> he translated works of Aristotle. He also wrote um, a, a number of books of his own, including uh, Super Auctorem Spherae, which um, if you put it into Google Translate, says something about the creator having translate sphere by his knobs, but it means uh, uh, the creator on the creator of the spheres, basically. Um, and within that, there's, there's a dialogue between a wise man and a simpleton, and the simpleton is called Sir Lupus Fiat. And that's an anagram of, of 
a phrase that's the Latin for April Fools. It's one of the earliest examples of an April Fool we have in the, in the pseudo scientific literature. It's astrology, but it's, it's similar. Um, there were wicked senses of humor among some early physicists. So well known for this in particular was Isaac Newton who grew to really hate Robert Hooke. So there's a famous saying that Newton wrote. It's, I mean, it's not the first person to more or less say the same thing, but the, the phrase that's, that's the version of this phrase that's most well known is the one that Newton wrote in a letter to Hooke. So he said, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. So Hooke was, was short of stature and, and had very pointed features. Uh, particularly, you know, his nose, I would say. So, um, so the idea here is it's been suggested by many scholars that, that Newton was having a dig at Hook. He was basically saying, you know, I've, I've stood on the shoulders of giants, but not on the shoulders of short people. And this is a deliberate, nasty uh, piece of humor by, by Newton. At the same time, it's recently been discovered that uh, spelling was all over the place in those days. So you could, you know, you'd, people didn't spell things very consistently, but, but Newton all, always spelled, when he referred to Hooke's law, he always spelled it as Hooke without the E. And when he wrote Hooke's name, he wrote the E. So it's believed that he's, uh, again, deliberately uh, pick, picking, picking on Hooke's nose, if you like, uh, by always referring it to it as, in, as Hooke's law rather than Hooke with the E's law. Um, there are many other historical physicists who've had sort of comedic tendencies, so I'll give you a few examples here. So Benjamin Franklin, obviously not completely known for his science, but, but also known for his science. So there's the famous, uh, you know, kite, elect electricity kite thing. Um, he was famous for practical jokes, particularly involving electricity. So he would, there'd be various things in his house that would give you an electric shock including uh, there was a picture of, of the king, who the king of England, who he didn't approve of. And if you touched this picture, you would get a shock. And he thought that was very funny. So there were a lot of things involving electric, uh, giving electric shocks to his visitors. Michael Faraday used humor a lot in his lectures. His lectures were extremely popular and started the, of course, the Faraday Christmas lecture series. Um, a little known fact, he also basically was the inventor of the party balloon. So he was also, a f I mean, it doesn't look like he's a lot of fun in this picture, but, it, but uh, we have it on good authority that he was. James Clark Maxwell was a great prankster, and I'm going to tell you more about him uh, in a minute. George Gamow, the famous nuclear physicist and early cosmologist and tributor to early uh, models of DNA and many, many other things, was also known for his mis mischievous tricks. So he tried to submit a paper to nature saying that, you know, when cows chew the cud, their jaw rotates in a particular way. And he claimed that they rotate in one direction, in one hemisphere and the other direction in the other hemisphere, and it's all due to the Coriolis force. And unfortunately that was rejected by nature. He wrote a series of comic popular books about Mr. Tompkins, a mild mannered accountant who learns all about physics. So they're popular ways of describing relativity in and he tried to include Mr. Tompkins as an author on one of his papers, and that was noticed by an editor and, and removed. Uh, he's also famous for, for naming the neutrino process that's called the Urca process after a casino on the basis that, that uh, you know, the centers of stars lose neutrinos at the same rate as you lose money when you go to a casino. So he was very well known for his tricks, and we'll see his name appearing at least once later in the talk. Um, so all of these people were sort of well known for their, uh, you know, for, for being jokesters on the side as well as being serious scientists. Let me say a little more then about James Clark Maxwell. So um, there's a lot of letters and details about his early life and included in there, there's this quote that he wrote when he was about age 12 in a letter to his father. He said, on Friday, there was great fun with Hunt the Gauk. We could believe for the clocks and everyone had a hole in their jacket. So a gauk is a Scots word for a cuckoo and hunt the gauk is the Scottish version of April Fools. So presumably, you know, people pranked other people by stopping the clocks or changing the time of the clocks. 
and and it sounds like cutting holes in people's pockets so that things fall out of your pockets and so on was a regular thing that he did when he was age 12. Um, he also wrote witty verses and there are many, many examples extant that you can that you can read. And he played many tricks on his colleagues, one of the most famous being in his inaugural lecture in Cambridge when he became the new professor in Cambridge. He arranged for it uh, to be the, the advertisements for the thing to be completely mixed up so that his, um, his uh, undergraduates attended his inaugural lecture. So there were only basically students in the audience. Whereas all the fellows and dons of Cambridge attended his first lecture of his undergraduate course, where he apparently included things like explaining the difference between centigrade and Fahrenheit, and was a very, very you know low level introductory first lecture. Uh, and he quite deliberately invited, made sure that people got invited to the wrong thing, and he thought this was very funny. And and they didn't didn't stop him being a professor. They kept him even though. He had apparently this wicked sense of humor. So Hunt the Gauk, as I've said, was, uh, was a phrase for April Fool's Day. Another version of that was Hunt the Dunce. So the word dunce, which is you know well known in sort of old mean jokes about school kids, you would get sent to the corner with a, with a hat on with the letter D on it for dunce when you didn't behave or you were, you know, you made stupid comments in class. And Dunce is actually named after Dun Scotus, who was another early Scot philosopher who uh, was a theologian and people didn't really agree with him. So there was a sort of insulting phrase that you're like Duns. So that became the, the Dunce in the English language. So Hunt the Dunce was another, uh, was another version of Hunt the Gauk. Um, on the 1st of April, 1861, so April Fool's Day, remember being important to Maxwell, he wrote to Faraday, who was much older than him, but they had a big correspondence, um, claiming that he'd invented, for his electromagnetic theory, he'd invented a new field called the dunce field, and which he named the letter D. And then, of course, afterwards, you know, it wasn't very long after that before he realized that he actually needed a field like this D field that he'd invented. So he needed the D field for real, and it's part of you know what we now regard as the complete set of Maxwell's equations to describe you know the behavior of fields inside substances. So he just renamed it displacement. Uh, but the musical started off as a big joke. Um, let me describe a couple of other hoaxes of early times. So you know nothing to do with April Fools here, but but uh, this was August in 1835. So one of the most astonishing hoaxes that was ever perpetrated was is often referred to as the great moon hoax so the sun newspaper which was in new york at that time was you know one of the most popular newspapers they started a series of articles which lasted a week so every day there was a more sensational level of the article and the claim is that the circulation of the paper increased dramatically during that week so the claim was that new information from john herschel who was the son of William Herschel, both uh, very well well known astronomers in in England at that time? That John Herschel, who'd done some observations from uh, South Africa, uh, reported on these new observations where they'd seen the moon in much more detail, um, and the articles came with these, you know, engravings of what things on the moon looked like, and you could see, you know, forests and fields and beaches and all sorts of geographic details. But if you looked really carefully, you know, by the end of the week, they were telling people that there were, there were bisons and sheep and there were, you know, two-legged beavers and there were blue goats and unicorns and man bats. And that's that you can see some of these in these pictures here. Um, and this was astonishingly taken very seriously by a large fraction of the readership. I mean, obviously, you know, scientists at the time knew that this was completely bogus, that you could, you, there's, there's no way you could see a, a man-sized object on the moon, let alone th that it made any sense that it would be there. Uh, but it was believed by a large fraction of people. Um, and you know, now it's, this is regarded as, in hindsight, one of the first big meetings. Remember, no internet, uh, you know, no telephones, no, uh, no rapid information. So everybody got their information from this newspaper and there was nothing else to, to back it up. So e even before the internet, there were 
these mass me media perpetrations of completely fake nonsense, um, which some fraction of people swallowed. So, uh, you know, eventually it became clear various people had to write things pointing out that this was not correct. Um, and eventually the author was forced to confess that he'd made it all up and he claimed for a while that, um, that this was a deliberate prank. But as far as we can tell, he, um, uh, you know, he was just doing this to, to make money, sell newspapers and become famous. And he perpetrated at least one other, uh, tried to perpetrate at least one other hoax later. So there's no, there's no evidence that this was a deliberate, you know, he was trying to joke people. He was, he was to trick people, um, which he succeeded in doing. So this was an astonishing thing in 1935. Another example of a prank uh, in physics is, is if you study electromagnetism and relativity, you, you realize that you're using Lorentz with two different spellings. And this is because Hendrik Ludwig Lorentz was deliberately trying to obfuscate things. So he would use different spellings at different periods in his life when he published in different journals. So when he discussed the gauge condition in electromagnetism, he used the spelling without the T when he discussed um, the relationship between refractive index and density in materials, he actually used both spellings to be even more confusing. But then when he discussed the Lorentz force and the, the, the Lorentz transformations, he, he included the T, uh, the T spelling. So this is one, you know, one of the prints um, that's ever been pulled off in physics, but also one of the least known. So a lot of people sort of think there's one Lorentz and then they sort of learn a little and realize that, it, that there's two spellings. So then they think that there's two Lorentzes, but in fact, there is only one Lorentz and it's just a fantastic trick being pulled on all of us uh, by Hendrik Ludwig. A very, very good example of a joke paper is this one. And I, I, you know, this is probably the only paper where I'm showing you the whole paper. So this is the entire length of the paper. This was written by Beck, uh, Beta and Reisler when they were all postdocs, uh, basically visiting Cambridge for various periods of time. The backstory here is uh, Eddington, who was an extremely well-regarded um, and knighted scientist in the United Kingdom, um, got towards the end of his career, got more and more interested in what we would now call numerology. So he got uh, obsessed and convinced by various arguments that were just basically messing around with numbers without any science that made any sense. So he had an argument for where the fine, fine structure came from. So remember the fine structure constant uh, alpha has a value that's about one over 137. So Eddington had, a, had an argument involving the number of elements in a 16 by 16 symmetric matrix and then adding one for, for some constraint where he could uh, figure out how to get the number 137. So uh, these three young physicists were all in the audience and they're all appalled uh, by what Eddington was saying. So they were inspired to write this joke article. Um, of course, you know, even although Eddington's mentioned in here, they don't, they don't mock Eddington, they mock the idea. So they call it good spoofs. You pick on the ideas, not the people. So, um, so what they did was write this very cleverly worded article. Originally it's in German, but presumably the same uh, ambiguity of language works in German. So the idea is to try to calculate the number of degrees of freedom in a crystal. And then you, you sort of very slowly uh, smooth over the, the gap where you, you're talking about degrees of freedom to when you're talking about degrees of temperature. And then you're using the fact that absolute zero is minus 273 in round numbers, minus 273, what we would to get today call Celsius, so minus 273 degrees. And the fine structure constant is one over 137. And 273 is two times 137 minus one. So they have this very clever argument where they, they somehow mix up the use of the word degrees and argue that they have an issue explanation for where the fine structure comes from. Completely and utterly nonsense. Um, they submitted this to this German journal and it was accepted. 
afterwards the editor when it was pointed out it was a joke was was incensed and a whole bunch of senior people wrote letters and so on and these were just junior scientists so they were actually forced to publish an apology i'm pretty sure they didn't regret what they did and it is actually still quite funny when you read it um so uh so even though they were forced to make an apology it's just because they were the younger guys and they didn't have a choice i think um but uh, it's it's incredible that the editor thought this was a serious piece of science. But uh, but there it stands, 1931, one of the earliest uh, spoof papers. Let me show you some examples of other parody papers that sort of followed on from that one. So another one that the the paper itself isn't a parody, but the author is that also involves uh, Hans Bethe. So uh, this has become known as the Alpha Beta Gamma paper. So the story here is that, that George Gamma was doing this work on the early history of the universe. So this is, you know, this is a seminal paper that still gets cited for some of the earliest ideas and where all the elements come from. Uh, a bunch of stuff in this paper is not correct, but just the idea that you could talk about where all the elements come from at all is more or less from this paper. So, uh, you know, the sort of ideas were Gamma's, but the detailed work was all Ralph Alpher. So Alpha was the grad student at the time, and he, he did basically all the grunt work on this paper. So then there was supposed to be a paper by Alpha and Gamov. Uh, and the story is somewhere along the way, Gamov realized that it was probably going to be published in the April 1st issue. And it would be really funny to add Beta as a, as a co-author. Uh, Alpha's talked about this later. He was, he was hopping mad, but you know, Gamma was the senior person, he didn't really have a choice. So he thought it would diminish his contribution to the paper and make the paper scoffed at by people and not taken seriously. In fact, the paper became more famous as a result of the joke title and being the Alpha Beta Gamma paper. So it probably, you know, the fact that it had a joke paper, joke title, joke author list in this case uh, was probably a good thing. And apparently, you know, this was in the press and so on at, at the time, and 200 people turned up to Alfred's PhD defense. So uh, if there's any students in the audience thinking about their own PhD defense, a joke author list is the thing to do, and then there'll be hundreds of people at your PhD thesis defense. Of course, you have to write something significant as well. Um, but that's the famous Alpha Beta Gamma paper. There was a joke paper by Isaac Asimov, uh, towards 1948, I think, um, while he was still a PhD student. So Asimov was a, was a chemistry graduate student and he eventually gave up his chemistry uh, career in order to be a professional writer. He was doing experiments where he had some particular substance that dissolved very quickly. So it seemed like, you know, you took a little piece of it on a on tweezers or something and sort of before you'd even got it to the liquid it seemed to have dissolved so he just thought you know wouldn't it be cool if there was a substance that actually dissolved before it hit the liquid and then you could start messing with causality because you could make it dissolve before it hit the liquid but then stop it hitting the liquid and then all hell would have to break loose because because it only dissolved because it knew it was going to hit the liquid so you could basically mess with causality and make Timings and there's several follow-up articles. Um, the final part of the story is here that the idea was Isaac Asimov knew that his thesis defense was coming up. So he got the editor of this, I mean, it's actually not published in a journal, but in the, the science fiction magazine. He got the editor of the science fiction magazine to, uh, um, to agree that it would be published under a pseudonym. But then either the editor never had an intention of doing that all along or something went wrong in the process, but his name appeared on the article and the article came out just before his thesis defense. Uh, and he was you know, completely terrified that these serious chemists would think that he was mocking the whole of chemistry and that they wouldn't see the funny side and so on. And apparently he had a long thesis defense and at the end of the defense, one of them leaned over to him and said, I just have a last question. Uh, what can you tell us about the endochronic properties of resublimated thiotimoline, Dr. Asimov? And then he asked, and there was a big thio relief. Um, so that's uh, time travel in a parody paper for the first time, probably. Uh, one of the best 
parody papers ever and something that's been a model ever since for parody papers is this paper uh, from uh, 1956, I think it is, on the imperturbability of elevator operators uh, 57. So this is a spoof of a paper by Chandrasekhar and it's uh, purports to be by S candlestick maker. Um, uh, and you might think, you know, that's a bit, that's a bit mean mocking Chandrasekhar's name, but, but you know, but, but, wait, wait a minute. So this turned out to be by John Sykes, um, who was, uh, who, you know, it said communicated by. Uh, John Sykes was a postdoc. He was trained in, in the United Kingdom as an astrophysicist, but then got a job with uh, Harwell, I think, working on, on fusion, the fusion project. So he went to Chandrasekhar's group, Chandrasekhar being the great theoretical astrophysicist of his time with his with a large group of people working on many things in, in Chicago. So Sykes went to Chicago for actually less than a year, I think, to learn about magnetohydrodynamics, to go back and work on this uh, fusion project. Um, and while he was there, maybe with the help of some of the other postdocs, he wrote this paper. It's a parody, very close parody of a particular Chandrasekhar paper. And actually by, by looking at them side to side, you appreciate much more of the humor because it really is very, very much like the paper. So you might worry that, you know, this mocks Chandrasekhar and, you know, maybe people are gonna be really upset. Sykes submitted it formally to the Astrophysical Journal. Chandrasekhar was the editor of the Physical Journal for about years, including during this period. The secretary who received the thing in an envelope, opened the envelope and went, oh, uh oh, this is a joke and Chandrasekhar is going to be mad. So she sort of very timidly took it to his office and said, you might want to look at this. Chandrasekhar thought it was the funniest thing he'd ever seen. Um, approved of it to such an extent that he insisted that it be reprinted in the AppJ astrophysical journal format so that it looked exactly like an astrophysical journal paper and, and distributed to everybody. Um, and he said, you know, not only was it amusing, but it contained all the aspects of how to perfectly write a paper. So that, and, and it's because it was based on his paper. So, but it's short and easy to read and so on. So he regularly gave it after that to new students as an example of how to write a paper. So he thought that in terms of the style and format of a paper, it was just perfect. So, uh, you know, so this sort of went down in the annals of history as an extremely popular parody and it was uh, shared by people for decades afterwards. Uh, you may wonder, you know, who's this John Sykes character? So in the astronomy literature, he kind of disappears and people stop talking about him, but it turns out he went back to, to Harwell and then he also had a, a, um, a flair for languages. So he became the go-to guy to translate physics papers from other languages, particularly at that time, German and Russian. So everybody would bring him their German and Russian papers and he would translate them. And then he started learning other languages by reading the physics paper and figuring out how you do, you know, Polish or whatever the, the new language was. So he became this great scientific translator. So he basically switched careers and became a scientific translator. But then he was so good at the language part that he was, uh, eventually snapped up by the Oxford English Dictionary and became the concise Oxford English Dictionary editor and the pocket Oxford English Dictionary editor. And uh, he was supposed to be the best cryptic crossword solver in history and won the Times national competition 10 times or something and then stopped entering because it was getting boring for everybody when he won every year. So he was a genuinely smart guy um, and this is about the only contribution directly to humor that I know of that he made. Uh, but uh, other, I mean, people might know more about him than I do, but that's the, that's the John Sykes Chandrasekhar story. And it's probably the, the template for other parody papers that followed. It set the bar. So a lot of parody papers more or less follow this format, I would say. Um, a recent writer of parody papers, uh, Warren Siegel, is a string theorist at Stony Brook. And he has lots of amusing pictures and so on. On his website, you can see his list of parody papers. And there's, I think there's 22 on this list, which probably makes him the most prolific spook, spoof paper writer that, that I know of. Uh, 22 papers is a lot of time spent making up these 
papers. The first one that he wrote was was called the Stupor Space, and has these uh, has these four authors who continue to write his other his other joke papers, um, and it contains you know many details. And he's particularly fond of typographical uh, play, so there's a lot of you know things like this about using different fonts and how to write physics equations with symbols that we don't normally use, like a telephone and so on. Um, so those are worth a look. Uh, and, and the last one he wrote last year, so he's still going. Sometimes there's a serious point being made in a spoof paper. So the most famous example of that is usually called the Sokol Affair. So uh, Alan Sokol is a physicist uh, at New York University. The motivation here was that there was a lot of stuff in the the sort of postmodernist philosophy literature. So in this boundary between philosophy and social science, people were, were writing a lot of stuff about how everything is based on context. And obviously there's a, you know, there's a place for that because that allows you to discuss, you know, colonialist history and issues, issues like that. But they also would extend it to everything including science. So there was a lot of stuff being written um, in the late 80s, early 90s about how science itself is just a cultural construct and, and things that sci you know, scientists claim there's this objective reality, but there's no reason to believe that that's real. Everybody's reality is equally valid and so on. And many scientists were getting quite upset that, that these things were being written and not, not uh, uh, challenged at all. So I take, take it upon himself to, to challenge this through writing a hoax paper. So he wrote a paper that purported to be about physics and how all physicists had got things wrong and uh, everything is valid and physics should, should free itself from the yoke of mathematics and then it will all make sense and so on. And uh, I just want to give you one, it's a little bit long, but let me just invite you to try and read some of this. So one paragraph basically out of, out of Sokol's paper. So you should get a, you know, it should be able to get an impression of how there's just a whole bunch of essentially nonsense phrases that are like physics, have some physics words in them, but just don't really mean anything. Um, so the, the paper is full of this stuff. Um, when after the paper appeared and it, it took, uh, it did get, somewhat reviewed, but not by any physicists. So they had it for more than a year, I think, a year and a half or something before it appeared in, in, uh, in physically in the journal. Uh, but they never had it refereed by anybody who was actually an expert. When it finally appeared, it quickly became apparent that it was a joke and then there was a huge storm of, of uh, response. So lots of journals and magazines and uh, etc. around that time were full of articles about the Sokol affair. So anybody who was there at the time can remember this very well. Uh, many postmodernists and deconstructionist philosophers were hopping mad that this joke had been perpetrated on them. But sort of the funniest part is that some of them actually said, despite the fact that it's a joke, then it's still valid because everything's equally valid. So that there's, there's a bunch of uh, very amusing statements by people about how it doesn't matter that it's a joke. That was uh, doubly funny, I think, at least for me. So finally, let's come to April Fool's Day and give you a few more examples on that because that's the day we're celebrating today. Um, there are many famous examples, too many to go through, obviously, but but just you know a few very well-known ones that were successful at the time because they actually fooled some people. Um, there's a famous early uh, television spoof about spaghetti being growing on trees and being harvested for the annual spaghetti harvest uh, in Switzerland for some reason, which I don't entirely understand, but I think that's where it was. There was a great spoof video um, uh, with voiceover by Terry Jones of Monty Python fame about uh, how people had just discovered that penguins could actually fly and they'd just been hiding this from naturalists for years. Uh, there was a famous incident in the Seattle where a comedy show on, on April Fool's Day on TV had a story about the Space Needle collapsing. And despite the fact that it was a comedy show and obviously a spoof, many people 
took it seriously and got concerned and they had to issue a, an apology because because uh, people were genuinely upset people you know i mean i don't think anybody died as a result but people changed their plans and all sorts of things went wrong as a result of you know avoiding downtown because there's a huge pile of rubble and so on people calling up what worrying about their friends who live nearby and all sorts of things like that so it's a very famous uh uh um seattle april fool story and then there's been more recent ones like uh uh, uh, Burger King had a had a good example where they put out a thing about how they had a left-handed Whopper, and obviously the Whopper is round and it doesn't matter what handed you are; it just eats exactly the same. But this, the claim was they had a one specially for left-handed people. There's a lot of examples also in science. I've just written a, a small subset here, um, including you know an early one that you could harness energy from the atmosphere that was uh that was in uh, uh uh you know written in this um uh german newspaper but picked up all over the world as a serious story um there were claims at one point that the satellites of mars were artificial and that was actually believed by people um there was a couple of particle physics ones there was the big on particles which were supposed to be the size of bowling balls. They didn't last very long, I guess, but they were, they could suddenly appear in particle experiments and a, a bunch of people seemed to believe that. And then later CERN had a story about discovering the force as in, as in Star Wars as the fifth force. So there's, there's been many examples in, in physics. And I, I mean, I just list them here just to, just to show you that it's, it's pretty common. It's, a lot, it's obviously a lot more than this. Let me tell you a little though about my, my own dabblings in trying to write spoof April Fool's papers. So I got together with, with Dr. Frollop, so Ali Frollop, and we've now written eight papers together, which is a, an ast astonishing number given, given that it's a frivolous activity. The first paper we wrote was Cosmic Conspiracies. And the idea here was there's a bunch of sort of coincidences in cosmology that I thought were worth pointing out. Um, uh, so, you know, this serious point here is that you you shouldn't get too worked up by these conspiracies. Um, and a later paper, the pie in the sky paper, which is dramatically the longest one, is about how you shouldn't take anomalies, so-called anomalies, seriously. So that has a, actually has a very serious point hiding underneath the, uh, uh, the nonsense, the apparent nonsense of the, of the paper. Um, but I want to say a little bit about this paper. So, um, I mean, many people will have noticed the name Ali Frollop is a bit weird. So the name Ali Frollop, just to be, you know, just to be clear to you, is an anagram. So we'd written these papers for several years. And then I, I got a student called Ali Naramani. So Ali Naramani is, is you know, it's originally from Iran. It, it, it's his name. I, I mean, Ali is, is, is his actual first name. So um. I would run into colleagues at conferences and they'd say, oh, you see, you have a paper with Ali Naramani. So what's that an anagram of? I tried working it out. I couldn't make it into anything. That you're, um, what, what is this? And I'd have to say, no, 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 no. It, this is actually a real person. I'm really sorry for Ali Naramani. But uh, uh, I mean, he had no idea that I already had this collaborator called Ali Frollop before he even joined me. So it was a, just a complete coincidence, a cosmic coincidence, if you like. Me, having read a paper by Sean Carroll about how physicists should give up falsifiability. And we thought that was a bit ridiculous. So we thought we should write a paper on how giving up falsifiability is obviously a good thing, but you should also give up other stuff like whether stuff is true and so on. So we decided to write this joke paper uh, attacking the falsifiability claim. And I, I, did, I did send Sean a, a preview copy and he said he thought it was quite funny and wasn't offended. So I just just to make sure. Um, but again, I was, wasn't picking on Sean, but on his, on his crazy idea. <laughs> so, um, so we decided to write this paper. And then it occurred to me that since Ali Naramani was going to be a co-author and Ali Frollop is around, it would be funny to combine the author list. And then the obvious author list would be to have the authors be Ali Frollop, Ali, meaning Ali Naramani, and then uh, Frollop is where one of our collaborators and colleagues at Simon Fraser University. So I decided it would be 
at least for me, the funniest part of the paper would be the author list because the author list would read Ali Frolop, Ali and Frolov. And I, I thought that was pretty funny at the time. I, I, uh, I mean, maybe nobody else thinks that's even remotely funny, but I did. But then I can't be on the author list because otherwise that's not funny. So I submitted it to the archive and it got bounced back saying they didn't accept submissions from people who weren't on the author list. So then uh, oh, other part of the story was Andre Frolov, like Hans Beta, was added to the author list with his permission, even though he didn't do anything. And Andre said, you know, I'm happy for you to do this, but, but you must absolutely promise me that nothing bad will ever happen. Nobody will, will uh, think worse of me for being on this stupid paper of yours. So I assured him that nothing bad would ever happen. So then we submit this paper, it gets rejected. And then I'm like, well, okay, I can put my name in the box for who the authors are, but I won't put my name in the paper itself. So when you look at the PDF of the paper, it still has the joke author list that my name is in the box when I submit to the, to the archive. So then the archive, there's some moderator, you know, who, who obviously doesn't know the literature and the people and so on. So the moderator sends it back saying, you have now seriously violated the policies of the archive by trying to get around the rules. So now we withdraw your submission privileges and you will not be allowed to submit any more papers to the archive. So then, and that includes the co-author. So then Andre Frolov gets back to me and said, you told me nothing that bad would ever happen. So then it took 24 hours to find a person who could sort this out for us so that we would be allowed to submit again. And that's the reason it never appeared in the late. Um, and I tell you this story because, because the story is much funnier than the paper, I would say. So that, that's the redeeming part of the whole thing is that we ended up with a funny story to tell. Let me tell you about one other very funny April Fool's paper. And that was written by a guy called Ken Woolner. Uh, I'm not reading the chat during the talk, but it may be that some of you remember Ken Woolner. He was uh, in the physics department at the University of Waterloo. So the story is supposed to be that Ken and his buddy, uh, whose name I'd have to look up, but uh, I don't see it written here, um, were doing a sort of tour of schools and they were in Ottawa visiting some schools and there was a blizzard. They got stuck in a hotel room um, uh, and it's just the two of them and apparently a bottle of whiskey. So they start making stuff up and joking with each other and so on. And one of the things that was in the air at that time was units only get capital letters if they're named after somebody. But the liter, the little L, often gets mixed up with a one. So the international system of units people had decided that the liter would get a capital L even though it's not named after somebody. So they decided, well, obviously, there has to be a Monsieur Litre who this is named after. So they made up this whole story about Claude Emile Jean Baptiste Litre. And they peppered the story with bits of French history and other French scientists that they met and so on, and left some gaps to make it sound authentic. Um, and, uh, and they put it in a magazine called the Chem 13 News, which is for grade 13 chemistry teachers in Ontario, I guess. And they included, you know, figures like this, where it says, you know, one of the things in this drawing was made by, by Elytra, who, be, you know, his father made wine. He eventually became a, you know, he decided that he needed a standardized volume unit. So he decided to be an instrument maker. So it says, you know, figure 15 with the star is the thing that he made. He can't even find figure 15 and there's no star as far as I can tell. Um, and then, you know, down, oops, sorry. So down here in the corner, there's another, and it's just that long cylinder that's apparently the thing that Litra made. So there's, there's many things in here that make it clear that it's a joke. But nevertheless, it, it started appearing in encyclopedias as the reason that the Litra, the Litra was given its name. So eventually Ken Wilner had to, had to confess. Um, and, uh, you know, the amazing thing is this is, I mean, Ken made other contributions and, and you know, I think was heavily engaged in teaching um, in his area. But, uh, but the thing he's most known for now is, is this joke that he made. So it's, uh, you know, a great to the importance of humor. Um, 
Another great hoax that was perpetrated that has a connection to, to April Fool's Day was, uh, was related to this thing called the Jupiter Effect. So the Jupiter Effect was a serious paper written by John Graben and Steve Plagman um, in 1974. All the planets in the solar system except Pluto, which at that point was a planet and of course now isn't, all the planets in the solar system were sort of on the same side of the sun for a while. But, you know, they weren't like all in one place or something. They were just sort of all vaguely on one side of the sun. If you work out the perturbing effect on anything on the Earth, it's completely and utterly minuscule. But they somehow got it into their heads that this would cause catastrophes on the Earth. And the San Andreas Fault in particular would crack open and, you know, everything would, would you know, it, there'd be huge catastrophes all over the Earth. Um, complete and utter nonsense. And, you know, Greben has written many other popular books, and this is probably the low point in his career. Um, you know, they later published a book called The Jupiter Effect Reconsidered, where they pointed out that all along it was obvious that it there wasn't going to be a big, big effect. And I think they tried to kind of claim it was a deliberate joke, but I don't think it was. I think they were really, they were really convinced for a while that they were onto something. And I think it was a very big seller in 1974. The connection to an April Fool is that Patrick Moore, who was the TV, big TV astronomer in the UK, decided to, to make a parody of this to show how ridiculous it was. So he said that Pluto was going to align with Jupiter at this exact time on the 1st of April in 1976. And that because of the, the, you know, the effect that would be pulling you up, everybody would feel slightly levitated at this time. Uh, and this put out all of the uh, people phoned the BBC to basically say they were floating and that it was all true. So, uh, so you know, obviously it did fool a bunch of people. I've come to the end of what I really want to talk about. Um, let me just say that if you want to see more details of what I've described today, I've there's a review article which I posted and it's on the archive today. There's the archive number at the top. Um, I scanned the archive for other joke papers today. I found 10 that I think are all joke papers. There's a few others where I'm not 100% sure, so I didn't write them down. It may be that a couple of these aren't joke papers, but I think they are. So I think there were about 10 joke papers this year. A couple of them were mildly amusing, but mine has more jokes in it because it covers the whole field in some sense. Um, and let me, let me finish there and just uh, apologies to uh, anybody who was expecting this talk. I think that's enough for me. Okay, so thank you, Douglas.